Go ahead and start the recording. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is one first of the Castle Grand Prix meetings where we will hear from our successful PIs, their uh, grant writing and award process, planning process. We have the pleasure of having John Ramsky from the mathematics department. Uh, uh, her team received an STEM grant from the NSF recently. She will tell us more about that adventure and the process. Joan, without further ado, I turn it to you. Thank you. So um, I just want to go ahead and share my screen. I just have a few slides um, and just a handful of things to talk about. And then I want to open it up for questions and maybe turn this into a conversation. So let me go ahead and share. Oh, I'm just going to share my whole desktop and see what happens. And um, let's start this guy. Here we go. All right. So um, everybody can see that we're good to go. All right. So um, I named my talk uh, Avengers Assemble. I have two, uh, one soon to be 21 year old. I'm used to saying two teenage boys, but one of my sons will be 21. The other one is 17. I have seen all of the Avengers movies. Um, if any of my analogies are slightly incorrect, um, I will add that I fall asleep about halfway through them. They're, they're pretty long. So, um, so this talk is about, uh, as Eunice mentioned, uh, the NSF STEM proposal that was awarded in 2021. Um, this was a two-year project. We started working on this grant in 2019. Um, the ending result was uh, $1.4 million of support um, with over 1 million going directly to students. So the majority of the budget in this grant is for student scholarships. Um, the NSF stipulates that they're interested in um, scholarship money for academically talented students who have um, um, high financial need. Um, and it's interesting, uh, Eunice and I met with the program officer and he, the, um, he talked about how the, the reason this money is available for these scholarships in such large amounts is because it comes from the fees that are associated with H-1B visas. So the idea here is to um, use that money um, to train a domestic STEM workforce. So it's, it's focused on students majoring in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, this is a six-year grant. I almost consider it a seven-year grant because I'm using this year to sort of plan things out. Um, and there'll be three cohorts of sort of 18 to 20 students. Uh, in total, 56 students will receive full tuition scholarships. Um, they will also receive an opportunity to participate in an innovative research experience over one of the summers. Um, they'll be put um, cohorted together in a calculus class. Um, we'll, we'll use an active calculus model that's been shown to uh, have a higher retention rate especially for students who are pursuing STEM. Um, they'll also be cohorted into a foundations class together. Um, so we sort of have um, a number of different majors that are eligible, but one of the, the stipulations is that students need to place into this calculus course. Um, so there's sort of, I think of it as sort of the freshman year, we have sort of two guardrails on both sides of the road. We have a couple of classes that they're cohorted into together. There's a chemistry class that if that's required for their major, they may also be cohorted into. Um, we'll have professional development meetings. We'll have um, peer mentoring and faculty mentoring. There is a dedicated academic advisor whose job will be to look out for these 56 students. Um, and then there's this innovative research experience. So the idea is that we've taken um, high impact practices that have been shown to increase retention and um, decrease time to graduation. Um, but the hook here is we really took a hard look at ourselves and we said, um, hey, what are students um, sort of, we, we consider their bandwidth um, in the sense of we have this commuter population, um, they already have jobs, many of them have families to support or other expenses outside of college. So can we take some of these high impact practices and make the time commitment lower so that they're more accessible to our students? Um, so that's essentially the, the gist of it. Um, this is one of our first advertisements. So we're working on um, recruiting our first class will be, our first cohort will be on campus in fall of 2022. Um, the amazing Sue Getterd helped put this uh, together for us. This is a little flyer that we'll be distributing. 
um, as we start recruiting in December. Um, and so you can see we're looking at uh, full tuition scholarships for qualified students. Um, you know, qualifications are they need a high school GPA of 3.0, they need to place in Calc 1, um, and they need a pretty significant level of demonstrated financial need. And they need to intend to major, ma major in certain STEM fields. Um, so, um, so again, so, so now back to our little Avengers theme. So now I want to sort of describe the process um, of how this, this grant came about. Um, let me start by saying it was sort of a top-down kind of thing. Um, I was approached by a senior administrator saying the campus, the campus wants to have one of these um, and they were looking for volunteers. Um, I think in the normal scope of things, that's not probably the best way to go about putting a proposal like this together. Um, but the folks that volunteered were very student focused um, and really understood our campus deeply um, and really cared about sort of bringing money to these students that need it the most. So it started off in 2019 as a collaboration between myself, um, uh, some engineering faculty. So Gassan Cridley was on board at that time before he was too busy being a cool dean. Um, Samir Rawashta in electrical engineering and Anam Spaka in computer and information science. Um, or I think he's computer engineering. I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, and then in the natural sciences, we had um, Dan Lawson in chemistry and Marilee Benor in uh, biology and biochemistry. Um, we also had at that time, um, Liz McDowell in the Science Learning Center took a, played a role in this. Um, and at the very end, we needed sort of a research question to ask. So we um, consulted with Pam Aronson in behavioral sciences, and she gave us some good advice at that time. Um, so the, the first iteration of the proposal that we wrote was, um, I would say it was a, I don't know, I want to call it like the kitchen sink model, um, or the, maybe we should have called it, yeah, we've got that too. It was sort of like, we went down the checklist of all of the things that NSF was looking for. They're looking for mentoring. Yeah, we got that too. They're looking for research. Yeah, we got that too. Um, and we sort of threw all these things in, um, but they weren't terribly intentional. Um, and the proposal wasn't terribly um, cohesive. Um, so when the first set of reviews came back, oh, we also used the grant writing firm for this one. So um, McAllister and Quinn, um, that's the grant writing service that's provided out of the Office of Research. And I have another slide and I'll talk a little bit about my experience with that in a little bit. Um, and it seemed like an okay proposal to me, you know, it was sort of put together last minute. Um, you know, the team really cared about the individual pieces, um, but the reviews that came back seemed to indicate, you know, it wasn't terribly cohesive. Um, we had a, there was a previous STEM proposal that um, is in the College of Engineering that um, didn't have great results. Um, and as part of this proposal, you have to write about previous STEM experience. So it was sort of hard when you have a, another proposal that was not successful that you're supposed to be building on. Um, I think that was a huge stumbling block for us. Um, the issue of sustainability came up. So the reviewer said, well, great, you put in this like high cost residential summer research opportunity, um, but how are you gonna pay for that when the grant runs out? Um, and so we really had to think about um, a number of issues with that first grant proposal. So second time around, um, we added a few other things. So um, again, so through the Office of Research, uh, we had the grant writing team of McAllister and Quinn. Um, and then in the second iteration, um, we kind of added, uh, we sort of, I think I would say in the first iteration, when Pam Aronson helped us out to try and think about who our students were and how to, um, how to optimize their educational experience, I feel like we brought her in too late. Um, so the second round, the second time when we wrote for resubmission, we sort of had her in early in the game. Um, and she also invited Carmel Price, who does a lot of work with our students and, and understands our students as, um, I would say both of them really understand um, the first gen nature of our students, um, the obligation that they have to work, um, and that we really need to focus on the fact that, you know, we have a working class population. 
um, commuter working class population. Um, I also talked to Ellen Judge Gonzalez in the SOAR program um, because that's a fabulously, you know, successful program. And I wanted to know sort of what was the secret to her success. And, and I felt like I learned a lot um, from those three folks who are not sort of normal uh, named folks on the proposal, um, but they really contributed a lot to our understanding of our student population um, and how to build a successful program. Um, a handful of other people came into play. So when you write a proposal with this kind of scope, um, NSF needs to see data. So you can't just say like, hey, we have students you know, that are Pell eligible and they're majoring in these majors. You have to actually show sort of demonstrated data. Um, how many Pell eligible students do you have? Exactly what are their majors? Do you have enough to give out the scholarships that you're claiming that you can give out? So I worked with um, Becky Chadwick and Tomas Malinowski in um, Institutional Research and Effectiveness. Um, they were a fabulous resource. Um, we could sort of formulate questions that we wanted to ask about this particular population. Um, and, and they were just really good at getting us great data. Um, I think that was one strength of both proposals was sort of the data really demonstrated the need on our campus. Um, um, so let's see, who else do I have here? I have um, Cedar. So the um, Center for Educational Design and um, Evaluation Research, is that it? Center for Educational Design and Evaluation Research. That sounds right. So through the School of Ed in Ann Arbor, um, in a lot of these grant proposals, you need an, an evaluation. So if you say your uh, objective is to um, say, increase retention rates from first to second year or um, decrease the time it takes for uh, you know, graduation or increase the percent of students who graduate within a certain amount of time. Um, an external evaluator, I think really makes the, the project look a lot more professional. Um, so again, this was a resource that I ran into through Eunice, collaboration with Eunice. Um, he sort of pointed out that, you know, having someone that's, that's not on campus and not sort of closely related to the project uh, makes it look like the evaluation is a little bit more objective, sort of you might think of it as, a, as an arm's length kind of thing. Um, so they've been extremely helpful. Um, I think they set up a logic model um, for the outcomes that we're trying to achieve and how those will be evaluated. And I think that was viewed very favorably um, in, the, in the reviews of the proposal. Um, that second year we also added in, so through a separate, um, there was a separate group meeting. So it was Eunice and Alan Wiggins, um, I'm trying to remember if there are other people involved there. I think there may have been, but they may have disappeared. Um, they were working on an S-STEP proposal. Was that what it was, Eunice? Do you remember? Yeah, I use. Uh, it's I use. NS, yeah, right. I use. Yeah. So it was a it was a similar uh, NSF proposal to support um, student learning. Um, they were interested in more of an emerging scholars model to support students in calculus. Um, and when they took their one pager to the program officer, um, they got some feedback that it looked more like an STEM project than an IUS project. So um, because I was in touch with those folks, I invited them to, to join in. I think that really strengthened the support that we had for the calculus um, part of the project. Um, and that was a really uh, useful addition. Um, I also have here, I hope, you know, um, I don't know, maybe I'm glad the right people are here and I'm not sure who's going to watch this, but uh, I have sort of financial aid and admissions as lurking in the background as the Hulk, right? Um, they're, uh, it's, we needed their support. So we needed them to sign on and say, hey, we'll check the credentials of these students and make sure that they're, you know, Pell eligible and that their citizenship status is correct. Um, I needed admissions to sign on and say, hey, we'll pass out recruitment materials. Um, we'll help you reach the right audience, especially because we want to make sure that we um, recruit from underserved populations in STEM. Um, and, and that was a little bit difficult to sort of find the right people to get back to you. As a, as a faculty member, we sort of understand how other faculty members think. We don't always understand what goes on on that, that other side of the house, uh, especially in enrollment management. Um, but I have to say, I think Melissa Stone was um, incredibly helpful in that regard um, and sort of helped me get things done and get to the right people. 
Um, Deb Peffer at that time was in admissions. She was also very helpful um, with that, that kind of information. So, um, so it was sort of an unwieldy group. I don't know, it was a lot of different people for me to, um, I'm not gonna say manage, cause I certainly don't think I manage them, but uh, to communicate with um, and put together some kind of coherent um, proposal. So any questions so far? Does anybody have any? Are you gonna keep going? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I guess, so this is the last slide that I have. So the other thing that I wanted to share with you um, was my experience. This was the first time that I had worked with the grant writing company um, from the Office of, of Research um, here on campus. And um, I feel like when that option was presented to me, it feels a little awkward. Um, I think I'm not a terrible writer. Um, and I'm also not somebody who, um, I feel a little bit weird, like it felt a little bit weird to be sort of handing over these ideas and having someone else write them them up. Like that didn't seem, I don't know. It, I know people do this all the time, but it felt very awkward to me. Um, but the end proposal, I was extremely pleased with. Um, I did a su substantial amount of writing on the proposal. Um, we would have weekly meetings. Um, I would meet with my team on campus to discuss the kinds of changes that we wanted to put into the proposal. And then I would have, I, I think I would meet with them on a Tuesday. I would write up our ideas. I would send those to the grant writers. Um, they would get me questions back by Thursday. And then I had another standing meeting with the grant writing team on Fridays to sort of resolve any standing issues and then bring other questions that I couldn't answer back to the group. So I was sort of the connection um, between the larger group of, of STEM faculty um, and the group of grant writers. And I think that worked really well. Um, I guess one thing that I found really freeing um, was the fact that I didn't have to worry about my writing. Like I could just write up anything. And if I felt like my language was awkward or clunky, um, I knew they would sort of straighten me out. Um, so, and it didn't, the end result didn't sound like it was in someone else's voice, right? So it didn't sound like, you know, Jonathan Smith in the English department wrote it or something like that. It was a very, um, it seemed true, right? The end result. So, so I wanted to share with you um, just a couple of documents that McAllister and Quinn helped provide for us. So one thing they do is they provide this timeline. So as soon as you start, um, as soon as you start your projects, they set up this timeline for you with all of the meetings. Um, the, or, the level of organization that they brought was super helpful because as you can imagine, this was a really big project, you know, especially bringing in people from lots of different places, um, bringing in different faculty members from different kinds of cultures, bringing in things like you know, financial aid and admissions. So just sort of the organizational nature in and of itself, I found really helpful. Um, so this is our proposal for the second time around, our resubmission. So we had a kickoff meeting in February. Um, the reason we didn't work with them um, a little bit earlier on resubmission, we had been meeting and working on the resubmission, but it was unclear whether or not we were, would be like allowed to use the grant writer because it was a resubmit. Um, so originally the research office said, no, you can't use them. And then later in January, they said, just kidding, you can. So. Um, so we had these, you know, weekly meetings, um, they have, they set up their internal deadlines. So all of the deadlines, I think that the, if you can see at the bottom, like there was an April 7th deadline for the entire grant, they had set up a, an internal deadline of March 23rd. I think that's from our campus. And then there was an even earlier deadline of March 21st. They wanted everything done because they have... Um, you'll see IPR written on this. That's their internal proposal review. So as part of this service, they recruit people to pre-review your proposal before it goes out, before the deadline. Um, so it does sort of back up your timeline, right? And it forces you to be on task because you're meeting with these folks every week. Um, but it's actually really, when you have a big project like this, I found that really helpful. Um, the other thing they did down here, you can see in this second part of the table, um, 
whenever you have a big project like this, there's a number of documents that you're expected to deliver. They made it really clear who's doing what. Um, so things like the project narrative and the project summary, um, the, the McAllister and Quinn grant writer, her name was April, she took care of those kinds of things. Um, but then the other you know, kinds of items like the facilities and equipment form and the budget and budget justification, all of that fell on me. Um, and of course I used, uh, Michael Hudson worked with me um, in the grants office on the budget. So that was really helpful. So, um, and then the other thing I, I thought might be helpful for y'all to see is um, the results of an internal review. So this was the internal review that happened. Um, we got it back on March 24th. Um, the NSF deadline for submission was April 7th. So they summarized, they had, I'm not sure if they have two or three people go through your proposal. They list the strengths, uh, the weaknesses. So, you know, I mean, one of the big things in these STEM proposals is the whole point is workforce development. That's the whole point of the program. You know, our number one weakness that they're like, hey, there's limited emphasis on that. So you need to hit that harder. Um, they didn't like our dissemination plan. Um, and then they wanted us to refocus our broader impacts. But they check every single, like if you look at the proposal guidelines for one of these things, I mean, they can be like 20 or 30 pages long, like listing all of the things that you have to have in this document. And they have these rubrics set up where they actually go into your proposal and they look and they see, is this right thing in the right place? Yes or no? Um, and you can see they have little comments over here, right? So, um, you know, do you have an overview, a statement of intellectual merit, a statement on broader impacts, you know, and they say met, but please see comments and they make some suggestions here. Um, so every single like item in the proposal guidelines is part of this, um, you know, from the font size, um, you know, all the way down to, did you comment on previous kinds of grants? So, um, so again, I guess, what, what do you want me to say about that? Uh, helpful, right? Certainly helpful to make have somebody like checking all those boxes and making sure that you're doing all the things that the grant proposal asks you to do. Um, on the other hand, like the first time through, we got these really great reviews back from this internal review in the 2019 proposal. I thought that was really great because this internal review came back and said, oh, this looks really great. You know, you guys have great data, um, but NSF, you know, felt otherwise the first time around, they didn't fund it. Um, so I think there may be some limited helpfulness to this internal review process. Um, but overall, you know, again, I would say um, it didn't feel like someone else had written it. Um, it didn't feel, and it, it helped, it, it really freed me up to just write and not worry about the writing. Um, I can worry about, you know, sort of the structure you know, on the program that we were building and things like that. But it really freed me up to just put my thoughts down any old way and not like sweat over details like I usually do if I'm writing the whole thing. So, um, so I think I'll stop there. That was super helpful, John, thank you. Uh, I'll ask if uh, other folks have questions too, but I'll just pose one. You mentioned this, but I want to highlight this point a little bit more because uh, Sometimes when we think about grant writing or project planning, uh, maybe not, not everyone, but some people may think that's like this mad scientist approach. You have to go to seclusion, work in your basement for weeks and months. Uh, that's one approach. But in, your, in this approach, you present it as more like open, inviting people, uh, seeking ideas, uh, feedback, seeking help maybe using some other connections, uh, taking advantage of Office of Research. Uh, and the one good thing, at least uh, on our campus, we are not very competitive. I know in some other institutions, for some grants, they only have limited submission and you may have some sort of internal competition, like, no, no, I want to submit for that, not you attitude. But I haven't seen that on our campus. People mm -hmm. are usually very encouraging others to pursue and help in any way they can. Uh, would you like to say anything about that aspect of this particular submission? Yeah, I think that I, I would describe that completely. You know, um, I, I think that's a great way to, to, to talk about this whole process. It was extremely collaborative. 
Um, in some sense, I felt like I was sort of the keeper of the information and the go-between between the folks on the U of M Dearborn campus and the grant writing team. Um, and, and by the way, you know, I think they would have welcomed more people at the grant writing meetings. And I did invite more folks from the, the STEM faculty to come and meet with them, but people were busy. Um, and I kind of felt because I was chair and had a little bit of extra time, like if they didn't want to do that, I was okay with, with handling that. Um, but it did feel very collaborative. Um, and it was great being able to sort of bounce ideas back and forth. Um, I think the group that met, the STEM faculty that met here on campus felt like they could sort of contribute ideas, but they weren't necessarily being asked to go home and do homework and write things up because they knew I would do that. Um, and then I would sort of trade my, you know, write up with the grant writers and they would hand me a list of their questions and, you know, why are, you, you know, these things don't make sense if you're saying X and Y and Z here. And I would bring that back to the team. Um, I think it was a great way to work. You know, I think it was, it was um, sometimes when you, sometimes when things are too collaborative, things also don't get done. Um, but, but I think having the grant writers to keep you on task ensured that you had a final product. And so that was really nice. Yeah. Liz? Oh, just like a couple of things. First, I am working with the team and we've been we're talking for two years and it's just really, and I, I feel like it's really frustrating. We're, we're not out on the same campus, but just as an FYI, I did talk to, um, because I'm here, I did talk to Marilee Benor about this grant. And I guess one thing I would say would be missing is a writing piece. I just, um, I'm teaching a class on science writing. It's a new class, FYI. Um, but in terms of retention, um, also you know, our, we're, we have these studio classes in comp and we're thinking about having um, discipline specific studios. So that might be something that you might consider, you know, as a, cohorts show up. Um, and then, then I also wonder about um, the Go Blue Guarantee is going to be kind of competing with, with, for you, for these students. Um, I, I, they're going to maybe try and change that grade point average um, because it was really not realistic to have the 3-5 grade point average. So I, in the future, that might dilute. I mean, I, 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 have you thought about that? So yeah, so so first to talk about um, writing in the science, I think you know I think one really nice thing we're going to have a lot of professional development workshops yeah. that will continue you know twice a year or so for these students, and it'd be really great if we could bring in um, one on on writing in science. I think that could be a really helpful collaboration, and I'm gonna I'm gonna follow up with you on that um, yeah. when the students are actually on our campus. Um, and, and Go Blue Guarantee could compete with us. I think it's the same pool of students that we're targeting, but I think the difference here is we're providing a ton of support for these students that they won't get with Go Blue Guarantee. Um, part, of this, part of this grant proposal is a dedicated academic advisor whose job is just gonna be to follow these 56 kids around. Um, Go Blue is not gonna offer students that. Um, the faculty mentoring, the cohorting, um, there's a, I, I guess I didn't mention that the research experience that we designed, we decided, decided a traditional sort of residential summer research experience was not in the cards for these group. So we designed a part-time um, research experience. I think Mary Lee was a big proponent of this, um, where students can participate in two different research activities in different STEM areas, um, half day for six weeks. Um, and they'll be getting paid as much as the sure students get paid. So it'll be sort of financially lucrative for them to do that as well. Yeah, and um, then it seems like if some of these students just decide STEM's not for them, the Gold Blue Guarantee is for, it's still there for them. Sure. Yeah, but I mean, I just wanna say about the science writing thing. Well, so ironically, I've been thinking about this class for a really long time. And then I finally was putting the class together like in whatever last winter, and I was focusing ironically on immunology. <laughs> So I was reading all about immunology, um, but then I just went really over the bend and I just started following scientists on Twitter. And I, that's all I do now is watch YouTubes of science people. But I, I think it just, I think the writing and the lack of putting data in context has really been a problem I've observed. So I, I think, I, I know I'm just saying putting writing into a program like that, I think could be powerful right. because scientists have a lot of power and, and science reporters, for that matter, have done a lot of damage, in my opinion. 
So I think, I don't know, this seems like an, I talked to Mary Lee about how I think that's, you know, kind of exciting because students are coming out of learning about like science are competing with each other for ideas, science is important. Um, yeah, sure. We'll, uh, we'll invite you to come talk to our students. That'd be great. Yeah. Other, any other questions or? I do have a couple of questions. Uh, sure. First, just to understand the grant. Um, so when it says 1.4 million, does that include the indirect cost or this is excluding the indirect cost? That's the total. That's the total. Yeah. So, so with 56 students, that works out to be around $17,000. For the full period, so that yeah. that means it's not a full scholarship, right? That means they are so, supported in some other way, right? So we are count. They need to be Pell eligible, so they will have Pell grants covering the remainder of their tuition, right? I see. So we're, we'll be covering sort of up to I want to say it's up to about four thousand dollars a year for the students, okay? Which is the remainder of their, you know, tuition costs. It, we're covering their unmet need. Yeah. I see. Okay. Okay. Uh, the other question uh, I was curious about. So you said that they look at, you need to comment on the previous STEM proposal. Does it need to be, uh, sorry, previous STEM proposal? Yeah. So does it need to be a successful proposal, a, a grant or a proposal? Um, so it's, a, it's this was an awarded grant. So the issue that we had was um, engineering department has an awarded grant okay. um, mm -hmm. that maybe just closed out a year or so ago. Okay. Um, and I want to say only at the time we wrote our proposal, only a third of the students had graduated. Okay. Um, and this was, I don't know if it was a four or five year time frame, um, but it was not like you had to write it down and you had to put it like almost within the first couple of pages. And it just mm -hmm. felt like who is going to read anything after that? Like after you say, you know, and so we really had to like talk to those folks and say, hey, and, and we did learn, like we learned, um, they tried to cohort them. They put them in the same math class. Um, they were students that were all in one major. I want to say it was like manufacturing engineering. Mm -hmm. So they bring their, their cohort in, but the cohort placed into like three or four different math classes. So some were in math 90, some were in math 105, some were in math 115. So, so now they have three sort of groups of students and they tried to put them in the same class and then students would go back and rearrange their schedule. They would say, oh, this class isn't convenient for me. I work at that time. I'm going to take a different class. So we really like mandated, we tied down, like you have to take our Calc 1. Like you can't get the scholarship if you're not going to sign up for this class um, in the hopes that that will really, you know, successfully help the, these students, you know, form a cohesive group. Um, and but that is only for one course that they need to be as a cohort. That's right, because they're After multiple majors. Yes, they could be biology and chemistry and engineering and yeah, absolutely. So we sort of have firm guardrails on year one with the calculus course and the foundations course and an optional chemistry course. Um, and then after that, we're just going to bring them back for professional development workshops. They'll have a research experience opportunity after their sophomore year. Um, but yeah, when you recruit multiple majors, like you can't keep them together. Um, but I will say with teaching active calculus, like I have taught that group. Um, and I do know, like, I'll be walking through the university center and I'll see two students that I had in my active calculus class and they're still hanging out together. Um, yes. and, and, and for me, if that's the only thing they get out of my math class is a, is a best friend, right? That's really not a terrible thing. Um, and I'll just add uh, about that uh, to my question, something I noticed talking to NSF program directors about this. Uh, when you report, when you talk about your STEM proposal, you need to uh, talk about all the STEM proposals happening on campus or that happened on yeah. campus previously up to a certain like five years or so. Uh, so you can have actually a couple of these on campus. And uh, this group was very careful selecting their uh, disciplines, majors, uh, because you cannot have multiple STEM scholarships uh, feeding into the same major, but you can, uh, whatever majors are covered under this grant, someone can submit hypothetically another STEM grant 
to cover the some other majors. Uh, most of the castle majors are here, but not all of the engineering and there, there were some other uh, castle majors that were not part of this proposal, right, right John? Right. So yeah. there is still room for other folks too. Uh, but let's say someone writes another STEM proposal, they need to address things going on with uh, John's proposal program now, and right. still they have to talk about what happened with the previous one at manufacturing engineering. Um, yeah. And is STEM limited to undergraduates? My understanding was, yeah. Yeah, I believe it is. I think they may have a separate one for grad students. Okay. Yeah, I think there's another pipeline for grad students, another program for grad, uh, graduate students. But for example, what I had in mind is when we, when I was at Bentley during my sabbatical, we would run uh, these sessions which were not targeted towards current Bentley students, but people who were in the IT space, but who were, who were trying to transition into say data science. So we would meet them in, in the evenings because a lot of them, maybe they had a house, they had a family or something and they could not afford to go to another city where there was a job. So they needed to quickly adapt, train and learn what was needed. So we would meet them twice a week and guide them through the process and not, of them, not all of them were, it just kept them on task and gave them the hands-on experience and a community that was built. Uh, for example, they could learn. So my, I was curious if there is, uh, what are the opportunities, what sorts of grants uh, could be applicable, if any. Uh, yeah, yeah, there are a few of those. STEM is not like that, but a couple of weeks ago, I was approached uh, by a nonprofit, uh, Surf Squad. They are pro uh, submitting proposals to NSF to train uh, people to be project managers. It's not a university. They are not uh, aiming undergrads or graduate students. They are just aiming professionals who are not happy with their careers. And by some sort of training on weekends and evenings, they want them, they are claiming they can turn them into project managers, which is apparently a high need area in the United States right now. Uh, so they were claiming with that training, they can place their uh, uh, participants into uh, pro project managing jobs. And if they already have a bachelor's degree, they have these tables like showing if they complete this program in six months, their salary will go up this much on mm -hmm. average. Mm -hmm. And they were asking for a, a mathematics partner in it because they want to include some math component into that too. So there are quite a few solicitations out there. Uh, I would uh, encourage uh, maybe connecting with Wes in uh, Office of Research. Part of her job is project development. Uh, so she's a nice uh, soundboard uh, uh, for these ideas like saying, I'm thinking about something like this, which particular solicitation this would address. And she can help anyone to go over the list and find the most appropriate call for that kind of a project. Yeah, I, I'll just echo Eunice's comment. This would be a great, great connection and resource for that. Two more questions. Do you need to disclose that you had a firm helping with the, in the project? No. In the grant. So that disclosure does not have to be made, like prepared by, assisted by, that is not uh, there. Okay. And uh, you said that there was some hesitation about, so what, did they help with the first grant as well? They did. They, they, okay. Okay. So they they, did. that is why the hesitation about whether a, a resubmit would, uh, because you want to right. somehow maybe. Right. Okay. So it's a cost for our campus. So yeah. my understanding is they have this, this calculation, right? They're paying these people to work with us, but they need a return. Um, yes. And so when you write a proposal and it's not successful, I think they kind of scratch their head and go, hmm, should we pay again for the, because I think the cost is the same, whether you're rewriting, uh, resubmitting something or whether you're writing a fresh new proposal. Um, so I think there was some, I think they were new. We were new to using um, this company and we were still trying to figure out what the policy was. So, yeah. So okay. they, although there is nothing official, uh, there is an unofficial understanding of a budget limit. So getting a writing service for 100,000 grand is not very likely because IDC, that will come 
through that grant will be so little compared to that service university will pay. So it has to be a chunk of uh, money you are putting in the budget uh, with the IDC that will come in the upcoming years will justify that upfront cost for the university. It is not a cheap service. So, and, and the amount of IDC that is kept, does it get, can it vary with the grant? It does. It is never a certain ratio. Uh, it is like people, when they think about it, they think about an average ratio, yes. but depending on the budget item, different budget items have zero or a different yeah. ratio of indirect cost. For example, if you get a conference grant, uh, I have a couple of them, uh, uh, participation, participant support is not in the, uh, is, does not get any indirect cost, but right. any organizer support, like hotel for me, gets indirect cost, but hotel for a conference participant does not get indirect cost. Uh, or like if the university books the whole rooms for all the participants, then there will be in indirect cost generation. But if people individually book their rooms and reimburse, maybe there will be a different procedure. So it is quite complicated that uh, IDC calculation. Okay. And, and even um, this grant, the, I'm trying to remember what the number was, but the IDC was not super high because a million dollars was participant support. That, that 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 is the reason why I'm I'm looking at the because one of the yeah. one of the motivations for of course getting a grant helps one get another one it just opens the door so there may not be that much of uh, IDC in the beginning but it just it 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 has a angry bird effect in some sense uh, so because here I did not see a very significant IDC uh, so right. I was curious okay. Right. Any other questions, Mahesh, Liz? And going back to this, uh, you said it's a six-year uh, grant with three cohorts. So are yeah. these students going to be supported over four years? Are we assuming right. a three-year timeline? What is the assumption that we make? So four, three cohorts each with four years. So, okay. so the first cohort is done in year four. The second cohort is done in year five. The third cohort is done in year six. Yeah. I see. So it will be 20 people, 40 people, 60 people, 40 people, 20 people. So yeah. the, the, the total number of scholars will go up, then will come down. Yes. Unless there's another renewal grant, then maybe it will stay at 60, 60, 60, 60, 60 80, 80, 80 for so many, so many years. But if the funding stops, you don't drop off the students off the cliff, you graduate them slowly, yeah. and then you, that's it. Uh -huh. Okay. And it's, I think that was one of the, um, so this summer, one of the things that I found this interesting, right? So you spend all this time, you write this proposal, you get this budget all set up. And then over the summer, um, the reviewers had made some comments and I get this comment from, you know, uh, the program officer saying, can you rearrange your grants? Like we really think you didn't pay your, so there was an academic advisor that I'd put in there. I think I was paying this person like for 10 hours a week. And they were like, no, that person needs more than 10 hours a week, especially the year that there's 56 students around. So I had to monkey around with the budget and resubmit you know, some revisions, um, but that was really nice. I never knew there was any like negotiation phase like that. I think that was really good because sort of we both got what we wanted. The reviewers got a, a proposal that aligned more with their values. Um, and we got, you know, another opportunity for them to take a look and say yes, so. Yeah, I'll mention that particular aspect one more time, this idea of I will write this proposal on my own in my basement. Uh, there are tons of resources on campus among each other, uh, our colleagues, but also uh, having the same attitude towards the sponsor, uh, yeah. whether it is NSF, NIH, or any foundation, just going there and before submitting, hey, I have this idea, will this, will this go? What, what, what do you think about this? Is this a good idea? Should I invest uh, time writing this proposal? Uh, they, are, they always give uh, not very concrete answers as you can imagine, but they are helpful. Uh, so even like 
when you interpolate some of the things they said, you can come up with a good understanding of what you have to do or what you can do, what you cannot. So I think communication is really, really essential here. Uh, here on campus uh, or, or with the sponsors, even before the submission, uh, reaching out to sponsors and running some ideas by them or I think, Asking yeah, particular people. Yep. Yeah. So just to give a particular example of that. So Eunice um, introduced me to one of the program officers and we ran the one pager by for the second submission. Um, and he made a really big deal about how you should have a table um, that states every single for every single piece and every single activity, like who on campus is going to be responsible for that. You know, so checking the um, admissions applications, you know, that's going to go through, you know, like financial aid is going to check the financial data and admissions is going to check the academic data. Um, and by adding that in, um, it really showed this, it was this really cool table that showed super broad campus support, you know, and it wasn't just like these five people, you know, in math and science trying to do this all together on their own. Um, so I, I thought, you know, I thought that was a really great way to convey that information, um, that your grant is connected. You know, your whole campus is investing in this. It's not just a group of a handful of faculty doing this. And is there a place where we can look at the grants that have been awarded on the campus? I don't know. There are a couple of ways of doing it. First, you can request it from Office of Research. Uh, they are usually very generous sharing information. For example, uh, for my RU grants, I get a request once or twice a year from Office of Research saying, hey, uh, this uh, colleague in engineering is planning to submit something similar to what you had. Do you mind talking to them? Do you mind sharing your budget with them? Do you mind sh sharing this with them? So they are helpful in that process. Uh, many federal agencies, they have databases where you can go and look up projects. NSF, NIH, uh, since these are federal agencies, they list all the uh, uh, awards they given in so, last so many years. It, it, get, it gets overwhelming, but NSF one has nice filters. You can look for specific projects in specific uh, regions. Uh, so you can, you get, you don't get the full proposals, but all the mm. abstracts are Abstract, uh, yes. publicly yeah. viewable. So you don't even need to reach out to PIs. You can just read the abstract on the NSF's website and NIH's website too. Uh, I will pose one other question, John. This is not, uh, this was one of the questions that people asked me to ask to all the speakers. And since yeah. this is a recording, I'm sure other folks will watch this too. Uh, this is not about the technicalities of any particular grant, but um, the, the way we approach these sorts of projects. Because uh, after all, you're a tenured professor, you're a department chair, you already have many responsibilities. And if you don't get this grant, you not, not much will change in your professional life. Uh, you are already at a very stable position in terms of what you do, what you want to do or what you don't want to do. So uh, from a point of view, this very practical point of view, you don't have many incentives to do something like this. So where did you find the motivation to take this very serious challenge, all this writing, communication, planning, coordinating, then running the program? Uh, where do you find that motivation? So I, I think that's a really great question. Um, I think this is not, you know, I, I didn't enter into this project for, you know, a line on my CV. Um, I think this is, and, and again, you know, because of the way this was initiated is sort of the campus needs this, you know, we want, we're looking for volunteers. Um, I don't think I could have stepped up. I don't think I would have stepped up if this was not something that I cared about deeply. So um, understanding the financial need that our students have, 40% um, of our students are Pell eligible. Um, looking at sort of retention and graduation information data, you know, showing that um, the, the delayed graduation rates for students that are Pell eligible, for students that are underrepresented minorities. Um, 
I care very deeply about all of that stuff. Um, so I don't think, I, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I don't think I could have done this if I didn't care about those kinds of outcomes. Um, if you said, you know, tomorrow you're writing a grant um, and it's going to do, I don't know, something that I'm not particularly interested in, it's going to bring um, more money to the dean's office, you know, or something, um, I'd be like, yeah, I'll pass, you know, that's not, um, but, you know, I, I was a student here at U of M Dearborn. Um, as a faculty member, I am very passionate about my teaching and I enjoy teaching, especially the freshmen. Um, I understand the, the student body and our, our population pretty well, um, and I care about their success. So, um, so this isn't about me, um, and, and I couldn't have done it if it was just about me. Does that, does that make sense? I, I love that answer, yeah. yeah. When we post the recording, maybe we'll put that there. It's not about me. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, John. Yeah, thanks for doing it for our students. Sure. Any other questions? If not, I will go ahead and stop the recording, but we can stick around if you want to chat more about different issues. So I'll go ahead and stop the recording.